So now I'd like to introduce our close colleague who collected uh, all this imagery with his team, and that is, um, please welcome to the stage, Richard Beavers, who is director of the Catlin CV Survey. Thank you. Hello and thank you, thank you very much. Um, what I want to do now is just take you through a bit of the story of the project and um, take you um, really on, onto the background of, of how this project has evolved over the last sort of couple of years. Now this project was really inspired by the work of this man. Many of you in this room will, will know who he was. Um, it's pioneer underwater photographer and cinema photographer um, Ron Taylor. Now I've known Ron for 10 years and he's been advising on this project since its very start and he was involved in the, the original concept for the camera. Now sadly Ron died um, a couple of weeks ago. Now one of the things that struck me uh, when Ron died was the world had lost someone that knew what our oceans were like 30, 40, 50 years ago. He was that record of the oceans, um, and we'd lost that. Now, together with his wife, Valerie, they taught me the concept of the ever-shifting baseline. Now, when I first met Ron and Valerie, um, I was a disillusioned ad man who'd just given it all up to become an underwater photographer. And they took pity on me because at that stage I wasn't a particularly good underwater photographer. Um, so they used to cook me dinners on Sundays. And I'd show them some of my images. And with each image that I showed them, I would rave about the, the underwater environment and what I'd seen. And they'd come back to me with a bit of encouragement at first, but then would say this one line. You'll never know how good it used to be. And that really got to me. At first, I didn't really believe it. Um, I couldn't accept that our oceans were better than what I was seeing. I was having these amazing encounters, um, and it, it just surprised me. So it actually got me starting to research. And I came up with some frightening, frightening statistics. First statistic I, I came across was the, that 90% of the large fish were gone. And it just surprised me that I didn't know that. Then another of the statistics that frightened me was 50% of the coral cover on our reefs have disappeared in the last 30 years. Now, that is less than the time that Ron has been doing underwater photography and cinematography. Then I started looking at the ocean in a different way. And this was a shot I took about eight years ago of weedy sea dragons on Bondi Beach where I was living. Now, weedy sea dragons for me are mythical creatures. They're just fantastic. And um, over the last few years, they've disappeared. Now, I used to um, dive at Bondi, and I'd see them on every dive. Now, I don't see them. I haven't seen them in four years. Now, this is something that's happening on the world's most famous beach, um, and nobody knows about it. This wouldn't happen above water. Then I started really um, to think about the, the statement that they said to me. You'll never know how good it used to be. And I've got um, two very young daughters. One's two and one's just coming up to one. And I realized when they learn to dive, I'm going to be saying exactly the same thing to them. So I decided it would be good to do something about it. Now, the biggest issue as I see it, is our oceans are out of sight and out of mind. And if you look at it, it's a bit of an advertising problem, a great advertising brief. 
So as an ex-ab man, I decided to tackle it. And I pulled together some of my um, ex-advertising friends, some of whom are in this room now, and we set up an organisation called Underwater Earth, a not-for-profit organisation, and our mission was to reveal our oceans to the world. How hard could it be? Now, it seemed like a simple solution to the problem. So we went about and designed a way of revealing our oceans to the world. Now, fortunately, technology had just got to the stage where this was all possible. So we came up with a design for an underwater scooter that could take panoramic images on a continual basis over large areas. And then we took some of the test shots and saw, yes, this is a concept that could work. And we produced our first mock-ups, um, obviously inspired by a certain company. But <laughs> we thought, right, well, let's reveal our oceans to the world um, online. And we decided we'd present this idea. Now, this was at the stage um, where we first approached um, Google and Catlin. Now, Google, for us, was the obvious starting point. Now, they have access to millions of people. If you want to communicate with millions of people around the world, um, you've got no better partner than Google. As it was mentioned by Luke, what, over a billion people um, visit Google Maps each month. So, with Google as our starting point, um, we also approached Catlin. Now, Catlin Insurance is the main sponsor for this project, and they have a proven track record in sponsoring innovative projects, having sponsored the Catlin Arctic Survey for the last three years. Now, in fact, their marketing model really, I believe, is a case study for all companies. Instead of spending their money on advertising, they sponsor innovative, high-profile scientific projects. I mean, it really is very clever. It gives them a far greater brand awareness and return on investment than advertising. Now, Coming from an advertising background, I just think that is, is, is very clever. It also gives them a greater understanding of their business. Now, Catlin, as an insurance company, helps people manage risk. And projects such as the Catlin Seaview Survey um, really helps them and the world understand the risks of tomorrow. Now, the third part is it does something good. It facilitates a globally significant project. So for us, it was a perfect partner. Now, there was one catch. We were all about revealing the world. Catlin wanted something a bit more scientific, a project that was based in science. So we went out looking for a partner. And we asked our other partner, Google, um, well, we actually, we just typed it in, for the leading coral reef scientist in Australia. <laughs> and we came across Ove. Now, Ove is director of the, the Global Change Institute at the University of Queensland. And really, Ove was, and, and Catlin, this point was a turning point in the project. Um, Ove opened our eyes to the potential, the full potential of this project. And he's taken it to a whole new level with the science, which um, he's going to come up on stage in a second and explain in a bit more detail. Now, with these three partners on board, we finally got the go-ahead in November last year. So it's been a, a fairly frantic year getting to this stage. Um, on the 11th of the, the 11th of the 11th, we got the go-ahead, and the Catlin Seaview survey was born. Now, one of the results of this is the camera that you see on stage here. Now, this camera has three um, very wide-angle lenses at the front, and it takes shots every four seconds. 
We can cover up to sort of two to three kilometers in a single run, and it goes for an hour at a time on each dive. But it allows us to reveal these underwater environments in a whole new way. Now the, the camera will be on display in the foyer after this um, talk um, and we have the, some of our partners, Divex, um, who have helped us develop the camera who will be able to talk, talk you through some of the details. Now, um, these are the kind of shots it takes, but it takes a lot of them. On a single run we take um, well in excess of a uh, thousand shots, which are then, it's actually three thousand shots which are stitched together um, to produce a thousand shots, which allows you to navigate through these environments. Um, now we have gone out publicly, and some of you may have seen the, uh, the press coverage that we've got overnight, um, with the fact that the Catlin Seaview Survey is a real game changer for the oceans. And that's what we believe it is. Now, this isn't a statement, though, from an ex-ad man. Um, I am renowned for a little bit of overstatement at times. <laughs> but this is actually a statement that came from one of the world's most renowned coral scientists, Ove. And I'm going to ask him to come up to the stage now and explain why. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think this audience, and uh, as has been reiterated this morning by Sylvia, uh, the oceans are the life support system of the planet, and without a life support system, life doesn't go on. Other life goes on, of course, as Sylvia said, but it wouldn't be as fun as what we have today. And it's half the oxygen we breathe, it's you know, a um, uh, quarter of the food we eat, and the ocean is absolutely essential for, for stabilising and uh, our climate and making our planet habitable. It's also, as this audience has, has shown, uh, a, a source of great beauty and inspiration for almost every person on the planet. And it is that great linker uh, that um, we need right now. Now, unfortunately, despite all that importance and, and value and so on, many of the reefs of yesterday are gone. And there's 17 of these types of photos in Australia, which were compiled by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, I think, that, that um, resonate with this point. This is a, a small patch of the Queensland coastline. We have a, a, a person enjoying the reef there, sitting on a coral. I guess that's not possible anymore. But this is what that um, looks like today. Now, there are literally 17 photos that are paired up like this where we can actually detect change over that period of time. So when Richard came and talked to me about the idea of getting 50,000 images that would give us a snapshot that would be precisely uh, geolocated, I, I personally got really excited because it's just the thing we re need right now when we're seeing major changes in the ocean. Yes, we all know it's going on there, but actually um, where it's happening and why it's happening is not always immediately obvious. And if we're going to um, save things like coral reefs, we're going to have to know a lot more about where certain things are impacting and then we can start to take, uh, take, take actions. 
So this is where I think the science of the Kaplan CV survey is extremely important. Given the scale and rate of change in the world's ocean, there really is an urgent need for science that's, that's able to increase its ability to detect and understand change at the global levels that it needs to be understood, to understand the risk and vulnerability of these beautiful systems. And of course that resonated and is one of the reasons why we have the, our, our main sponsor, Catlin Insurance, because their game is all about that. It's about estimating risk and vulnerability. And of course, given that rate of change and how little we know about the oceans, there really is a, a, a need for this sort of new thinking, game-changing approaches to looking at the problems that our ocean faces. And so the Catlin CV survey, I th and I'm quite happy to be quoted there, uh, is that type of game-changing approach to this problem. So um, the project starts uh, on the world's one of the world's largest, I have to be careful now because I think the Americans have a very large Hawaiian monument that I've got to be careful with, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. One of the world's largest marine protected areas, the Great Barrier Reef and the Coral Sea Conservation Zone, which has just been proclaimed. And uh, it, like all of these other coral reefs around the world, houses over a million species and is part of that um, support to over 500 million people uh, in the world in terms of their daily existence. The coral reefs, I would argue, not just because I'm a coral reef biologist, but they're incredibly important, yet they're incredibly fragile. So the Catlin CV survey is going to have three components. The first component is the shallow water survey, which is basically at about five metres, looking at how reefs, the structure and function of reefs at that, that depth. It's also going to have a second component, which I'll talk about in a minute, the deep sea uh, the deep reef survey, which is going beyond scuba diving depth. And then uh, it'll have this, this last lasting legacy, uh, the global uh, reef record. Let me tell you a little bit about these uh, parts of the survey. The shallow water survey will record several kilometres of coral reef at each of the sites that it goes to. And these images will be taken back to the Global Change Institute and using some innovative image recognition software will be analysed for the presence of, of coral, uh, fish, turtles and a whole range of, of, of different organisms. And this is part of a uh, collaboration with Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography in San Diego where they've now trained computers to look at photographs and identify corals and other elements of those photographs which is absolutely essential because by the end of the year we're going to have 50,000 images and there's no way that scientists could sit down and, and, and use the same old techniques to, to analyse those photographs and, and get their head around what's going on. At the same time uh, as this is going on, uh, the scientists will be uh, deploying stereoscopic uh, cameras which will give us uh, information on an incredibly important part of coral reef uh, biology and that is the structure of reefs. As you know, corals build a framework, uh, and it's that framework that's so important for protecting coastlines, for building islands, for housing all those species, for providing that, uh, that habitat for fisheries. Using these techniques, we'll be able to automatically get an idea of that three-dimensional structure, because there's very worrying signs around the world that with ocean acidification and global warming and other impacts, that that three-dimensional structure is starting to break down, because that has huge implications. Um, for the world's fisheries, for coral reefs in general. Now, while the um, shallow water environments have been visited uh, over the last, uh, um, last 50 years or so since the invention of scuba diving, the, the deeper water habitats um, of places like coral reefs have not been visited that often. And in fact, we know very little. And one of the stunning facts about the Great Barrier Reef is that 93% of it is beyond scuba diving depths, at least safely. And we actually don't know much about those habitats. And just as an example, we had a test run with these diving robots, remotely operated vehicles that we're using on this project. A six day, six day um, expedition to sort of test this out, and this was fooling around with the technology, so we really didn't get much time at depth. But we had four new records of corals for the Australian region and discovered a brand new species of pygmy seahorse. And that's just an example of the biodiversity down there that's so important 
that we don't know anything about. Now the other, other issue about these deeper areas of the reef is that they may turn out to be incredibly important refuges uh, against the very rapid changes that we may see over the coming decades in terms of the shallows. So we need to know a lot more about this. And there's really nothing known about them. And one of the ones that uh, we're going to try and crack on this trip uh, with these diving robots and instrumentation packages that we put down at, the, at these depths and come back and collect later, is to answer the question whether deep water habitats uh, spawn at the same time as shallow water habitats. You know about the great spawning event on the Great Barrier Reef? Well, that's triggered by the warming of the water coming into the summer, but the crucial trigger is the phase of the moon. So corals have special proteins in their tissues where they can actually tell uh, what phase of the moon we're at. They can actually detect moonlight. Well, the big issue about deep water habitats is if they're spawning at the same time as that mass spawning event, how do they know about the moon when they're under three, 300 feet of water? So it's one of these sort of questions. It's like visiting the Amazon for the first time going to these depths, that we're really discovering things, important processes that we need to nail if we're going to understand and preserve them. So the last component of this project uh, is the global reef record. Now, much of what's happening in this project is about technology suddenly maturing. So we've, we've got this amazing network that's been built up through Google and other companies through this, you know, hardwiring the planet for globalisation. We've got those diving robots that have become sort of, you know, the average man and woman can own one now, even you. It's a bit expensive, but, you know. And they're a lot of fun, though. Um, but there's also been a revolution in the sort of technology for storing data, archiving data, and so on. And one of the lasting legacies of this project is to create an archive of everything that's collected as this um, project goes globally and collects that vital information, all the video, all the physical and, and, and chemical measurements, and so on, all those images, and make them available to everyone. So if you're a scientist that wants to sort of have a look at a particular area, you can go there and look at that archive. And as we saw with those matched pairs of photographs, there's so much information there that's so valuable for us to understand the changes going on and get our heads around the, the solutions. So the expedition, uh, as Richard said, has already headed out into this large part of the planet's uh, biological inheritance and uh, it will be visiting 20 sites and doing shallow water and deep water surveys uh, in those, those, those areas and already this started on September 16 but already the expedition has been uh, making discoveries, posting things, um, there's huge amounts of value already that's, that's come around. Now one of the most exciting op uh, opportunities here is this outreach through the Google platforms. And this is, I think, really important because scientists for so long have been talking to scientists and they are 99.9% .9 sure that coral reefs will disappear. But, I mean, it's, it's like no one else seems to know that. You guys know that. But the rest of the world doesn't. And if we are to really solve these problems, we've got to get everybody on board, be that Russian grand grandmothers, Australian businessmen, Ethiopian teams. This is a global problem that needs global awareness to actually um, solve it. And one of the most amazing, um, uh, one of the most amazing things that uh, I was told the other day is that 99.9% .9 of people have never gone diving. So that ignorance, about, well I shouldn't say ignorance, that lack of awareness about the ocean is really being driven by the fact that people haven't been there. And so if we can get as close as we can to getting a billion people to go virtually diving and to understand what's at risk and to understand the problems, I think we really do stand a really great opportunity to really tackle. So for me, Richard came up and told me about Reveal, which is brilliant. What we want to do is to take this project on the science level and measure, inform and understand and then hopefully act. And I think that's really why I think this is game-changing. 
and it's going to involve a lot of partnerships across science. What we're looking for are um, more partners to join us on this mission because it is really a global effort. And this is a quote from Sylvia, which is 100% correct. We are at that critical decade right now where the decisions that we make today we will have to live with for tens of thousands of years. That's a stunning moment of realisation that it's up to us right now to get this right. We need to get out there and make people aware of what's going on. And that's why this, you know, science is a mysterious business. The idea that people can drop in and see the scientists at work, they can come diving with us, they can see the latest results, I think will go a long way to achieving this end. So I'll leave you with one of these images and I believe we're now going to hook up with... Yep. <laughs>